Hey everybody, Jake here with Jake Wu Market Research to go over what is the anchored volume profile, how to add the anchored volume profile on TradingView, and go over what is break-even supply, break-even demand, and what is a volume gap. So to start with, what is the volume profile in general? Well, the volume profile is essentially the ability to look at volume as a function of price rather than a function of time. So if you look at my chart here, you can see here that we have volume on the x-axis and volume on the y-axis. The volume on the x-axis is your traditional volume that you look at uh, for a specific time frame. So we're on the NEO chart, on the monthly chart. So each one of these bars on the bottom of the chart represents how much volume occurred within that month. So you're essentially measuring the amount of shares that occurred within a specific time frame. Well, the volume profile is exactly opposite. And you'll see, and if you can see this here, if you look at my screen where I made this circle, this is essentially just measuring how much volume happened at this particular candle, which is July of 2020. And you can see there was a pretty decent amount of volume for that month. The volume profile measures volume as a function of price. How much volume occurred at a specific price area, price range. And that is really dependent on how thick you use the volume profile bars. So for example here, if I double click this, you'll see that if I go to inputs, one of the, one of the inputs is row size. So you can see here, if I change this from 10, which means that I'm measuring price over 10 different price ranges, if I do 50, I'm now measuring price in 50 different smaller price ranges. So each one of these gray bars represents how much volume occurred at a specific price and the width of that bar tells us what the range of price that we're measuring. So if we go back to the 10, you can see here that we're essentially measuring the price range of seven to $13 and how much volume occurred within that area. And you can see the green bars essentially tell you the range at which we're measuring the volume. And that price range, as I mentioned, is from seven to $13. So this gives you an idea of how you can really get a general understanding of what this is measuring. Anything on the x-axis, you're measuring volume as a function of time. When you're on the y-axis here, you're essentially measuring volume as a function of price. And the thicker that the bar or the volume row that you're looking at is, the bigger the price range that you're measuring. So as I mentioned, the smaller amount of rows that you have, the larger the price range. The more amount of rows, as I mentioned with the 50 rows, the smaller price range increments that you're measuring. Now, how exactly do you turn the anchored volume profile on TradingView? You simply go to the forecasting and measurement tools here. You click the little side arrow and you go to anchored volume profile. And you'll see here, when you click from a specific candle, I personally like to measure from swing lows and swing highs. So if I click this candle here, which was the low on April 26th, you'll see that the volume profile shows up pretty much measuring anything from this candle all the way to the current candle here. So I'm pretty much measuring where has volume aggregated since April 26th all the way to August 9th which is when I did this video. So the anchor point essentially tells you where are you starting the measurement of the volume profile. Now, the a couple things about this. One, this is definitely a volume profile that I've made unique to my specific settings. Uh, you can change this, as I mentioned, uh, 50 is going to make things a lot more granular. The price ranges are gonna be a lot smaller that you're measuring. I personally like to use 50. It's not too granular, but it's also not too thick. So 50 rows is what I like to use. On the style side of things, I pretty much just use all the up volume, down volume, value area up, value area down. I just use this, this middle gray color. You can use whatever color you want. It's actually gonna show up very differently when you pull up the default settings, but you can easily just change that and make all of these uh, gray by simply just clicking the middle gray button here for all four of these. One thing that I'll also mention too, you want to make sure the value area volume is 100. 
Uh, I think default goes at 70 and you'll see here that it definitely changes the look of the volume. You can see the lower volume bars here are uh, a lot less gray. So if you make that 70 and you make all of those, all of the up volume, down volume, value area, val value area up, value area down, all that same color gray, you will get a, a universal gray here for all of the different volume bars that you see. Now, one question you may have, it kind of looks like some of these bars on the bottom are thicker than the top. That's because I'm on log scale and log scale treats uh, levels differently dependent on you know how, how much price range you have. So instead of looking at dollar by dollar, it's looking at this as a function of percent. So if we went to linear scale, you'll see here that all the bars are going to be the same exact, uh, the same width. So the, when you're using log scale, that will slightly change how this looks. Uh, but you know, if you're using, if you're using a chart with a huge range, you're generally going to want to use log scale, log logarithmic scale. So one thing to note about the anchor point. So the swing low anchor point or the swing high anchor point is usually what I use. I definitely want to make sure that I have enough candles here for a swing low view, uh, volume profile. For example, I'm not going to anchor the volume profile from a point that only has five or six candles. I need to see quite a bit of volume here or a, quite a bit of price action to get an accurate view of, of the volume profile. Now, one thing I'll mention too that I forgot, the histogram box I think is going to end up being some, looking like something like this when you go to the default settings. If you want to get rid of this box, pretty much just showing you what, what the anchor is measuring, so pretty much the box that I made earlier, that's what that's showing. If you want to turn that off, you just put the color of your background as the histogram box and it will go away. So if you don't want that box, just make it the color of your background and it will just blend in. One thing to note, if you're measuring the volume profile from the swing low, you're not going to get any volume readings above the highest price that you have within the, within the measurement area. That's because you're not measuring any volume that has a higher price than this area because you're pretty much only measuring from the swing low here to the swing high. So that, that's why there's no volume bars above this because that's, it's only measuring the volume profile within the, this price range that we started from the swing low, right around $11.70, all the way up to the high around $28 on the dot. If you want to get an idea of what volume is going on above this area to potentially look for resistance zones, you would do from the swing high. So same thing. Just go to anchored volume profile in the measurements and forecast or measurements, forecasting and measurement tools. And you would just click this swing high candle and you'll see now we're measuring from this point. Now notice that there's really still not a lot of volume up here. So we can pretty much say there's not a lot of volume supporting price above this area, which sometimes is good because you don't have a lot of friction for price if you continue to move up. Now you can see here that price did not hold this, this area. I like to call this a volume shelf. And I came up with the term simply because this looks like a shelf of volume to me. Uh, doesn't really get much more complicated. Uh, it's very simple. Volume shelf is just where you have a, an aggregation of a lot of different nodes here. And so it kind of creates a shelf. A lot of the time price can, can act as, or these can act as a kind of a launch pad for price. However, when price breaks below and closes below the bottom of these shelves, you can get very quick moves to the downside. And that's because you don't have a lot of, a lot of volume here to act as friction for price to get through. If you want to use a football analogy and you're looking at a runner who just got the ball in football and they need to get through the kind of defensive line, once they get through all of, all of those uh, people at the line and then they break through kind of through a gap, then they can really accelerate through that area where there's not a lot of players that are going to potentially tackle them. So they can start to speed up and start to run faster. Same thing for price. If price breaks through the shelf, you don't have a lot of shares to act as potential friction below. So what do I mean by friction? Okay, so you have break-even supply 
and you have break-even demand. So I'll go over both of those. This is the volume gap. The volume gap is where you don't have a lot of shares. You don't have a break-even supply or break-even demand. You just have essentially a vacuum for price to move down through. So first one is, what is break-even demand? So this is Amazon. I, met, I am anchoring the volume profile from this November 21 pivot. This is pretty much where we ended the bull market and started this move down. So that was a status quo changing point for this chart. So very similar to how you can use the anchored VWAP. You, you want to anchor from important reversals in the market, important status quo changes in the market, swing highs, swing lows. So in this case, you can see here that we have break-even demand. Break-even demand is created when price is above this volume shelf. Why is that? Well, imagine that you bought shares over here in September of 2022. As the price went down, you had quite a big drawdown. However, price moved back up and all of a sudden, you are now back to break even. So initially, this area acted as what's called break even supply. You just dealt with a huge drawdown. You're now back to break even. The chances of you potentially taking some off the table, some shares off the table are pretty high. And if you, the average person is likely going to take some off the table. And you can see here, based on these volume nodes, there's quite a bit of volume holding here. So as the price gets back up to this area, this initially acts as a supply zone because people say, wow, I just dealt with a huge drawdown here, maybe a 50% drawdown, and now I'm finally back to break even. Maybe I'm gonna take half of my shares off the table and sell half so I don't have such a big position. That is why when price is below this vol these volume nodes, that's why we call it break even supply. Break even demand is when price then gets back above this area, moves up, now, all of a sudden you move from around 130 to 142 and price moves down. Now, in the profits that you did have from holding around 130 and then it moves all the way up to around 143, if you move back down, maybe you're gonna start scaling out because you're moving down, you have profits, you own at 129, it's at 143, pulls back. Then, all of a sudden, once price gets back down to the break even demand, because this is where you initially demanded the stock, price goes above. Now everybody who had profits are back down to break even. A lot of the time price can bounce here, not necessarily because a bunch of buyers step in. It's because everyone who was selling who had profit, who bought in the 125 to 129 area, and then price went all the way to one, the 140s, if price moves back down, people are gonna stop selling. So supply dries up and that's actually how you can catch a bid. You don't always have to have an increase in buyers for prices to bounce. You can simply just have a decrease in sellers and a decrease in supply to get that bounce. So that's why we call this area break even demand because initially where you demanded the stock, you moved up, you had profit, maybe you start selling some. So now once you're back to break even where you initially bought the stock, you're likely gonna stop selling because you don't have any profits and that's where price can stabilize and get a bounce. So that is break-even demand and we just went over break-even supply a little bit but here's an example on Twilio as well where essentially, same thing. Let's say that you initially bought Twilio at, let's say 74, right around, or let's call it around 72, right around here. You buy it, it draws all the way down to 45. You then hold it, it moves all the way back up to where you bought it, which you can tell there's a lot of other shareholders that also bought here that dealt with the drawdown. What's gonna happen? Well, some of these people, maybe including yourself, are going to at least scale some out because they just dealt with a huge drawdown. They're back to break even. They wanna at least take some off the table, maybe due to opportunity cost. Maybe they think they're not gonna Maybe they think their money can work better elsewhere. Maybe they can make quicker profits somewhere without having to just wait for a drawdown like you just dealt with. So some people are gonna take everything off the table. Maybe some people take one fourth of their position off the table, maybe some take half. Either way, the aggregate 
average person selling because they're back to break even after dealing with a drawdown makes this area a resistance zone because now those people who dealt with a drawdown are back to break even and are selling because they want to get out of the position because maybe they're too exposed or maybe they just don't want to have as much exposure. So that's why this is called break even supply because that psychological kind of effect of people taking some off the table after getting back to break even after a drawdown creates supply in the market, which creates resistance in the market. So uh, hopefully this video was helpful in understanding what is break even supply? What is break even demand? How can you use this area as potential support? How you can use break even supply as potential resistance? as well as volume gaps. Volume gaps, as I mentioned before, are just kind of vacuums in price where you don't have a lot of break-even demand or break-even supply. You don't have a lot of friction for price to move. So price can move very quickly through these essentially holes, but they're, they're not always price gaps, right? A price gap is this, where you actually have a gap in price. There's no price action. Volume gaps do have price action. Notice here that there's not a lot of volume within this general area. But you still had price action to the left. So there's not necessarily a price gap. There's just not a ton of liquidity here. You don't have a lot of volume supporting price, which allows price to move very quickly either to the downside or same thing to the upside if there's not a lot of volume there to keep price from moving quickly. So, you know, once again, swing low, swing high. That's where you generally want to anchor your, your volume profile from. If you want to get an idea of what volume is above an area, but you're only measuring pretty much from the swing low to this area, you're going to need to move to the left. And that's where you would potentially anchor from the swing high to get a better idea of where price is. In this case, as I mentioned, you really don't have a lot of volume up here supporting price. So if, if, the price was able to get back above this volume shelf to create essentially a break-even demand. Remember, if price is below, this is initially gonna act as break-even supply. Once price gets above it and pulls back, that's when it becomes break-even demand. And then if it continues to move up, you don't have a lot of volume supporting price here, which allows price to potentially move very quickly through. So hopefully this video was helpful in understanding that and understanding how you can add the volume profile on trading view and once again go back to this graphic to get an idea of what exactly the volume profile is it's measuring volume as a function of price versus measuring volume as a function of time volume profile is on the y-axis volume as a function of time is on the x-axis and it's measuring how much volume occurred at a specific candle whereas volume profile is measuring how much volume occurred within a specific price range in this particular example for this bar we're measuring how much volume occurred from seven dollars to thirteen dollars hopefully this video was helpful if you have any questions you can comment remember i do have a twitter subscription where i post market research daily for ten dollars a month i'll post the link in the description if you want to check that out it's simply on my twitter profile you click subscribe through a web browser and you'll get access and if you enjoyed this video, definitely check out some of the other videos I've made on other technical, educational type video uh, content. And if you do like these videos, please subscribe because I do market updates every two weeks. And I do a more in-depth market update for Twitter subscribers as well every two weeks. Thanks so much for watching. Hopefully this was helpful and have a great day.